Okay, welcome everybody to this today's webinar. Um, the topic is creating the connected treasury, a blueprint for transformation. Uh, we're going to talk about connections, connectivity, uh, treasury, and a little bit about the future as well. Um, we're here with our panel of speakers. Um, I'll go from left, left to right. I'll quickly introduce them. Uh, we have Matthias Resch, Senior Director of Finance, Oper Finance Operations at BERT. Uh, we have Ramon Talk, uh, Senior Director Treasury at Avery Dennison, uh, Thomas Daniel, Head of St St Strategic Projects from AGCAP, uh, which is also the sponsor of this session, and I am Patrick Koens, I'm owner of uh, Cunha Treasury and Finance, and I will be moderating these sessions. Uh, before we start, some housekeeping. Um, the session is supposed to last uh, one hour. Um, I have questions for about 45 minutes for the panelists uh, and 15 minutes reserved for the audience to ask questions. Please make use of that. We always love audience questions, especially the questions which we didn't rehearse uh, and get spontaneous answers. Feel free to already post the questions uh, in the questions box or, or in the chat and we will see them. Um, if we, we think the questions are relevant at that time during the discussion, we will prioritize these questions already during the discussion. Uh, but there's definitely time to ask questions at the end. Uh, there's time reserved. Um, so without further delay, uh, let's start the webinar. And let's start with the basics, the basics on a connected treasury, um, uh, which is the topic of this session. Um, Thomas, let's start with you. What is your vision on a connected treasury? What's your definition of a connected treasury? Well, um, to start with this question, treasury for us is by essence connected. Uh, treasury management system needs to be the single source of truth of, for all transactions in flows and outflows. So actually connected treasury is a crucial link between banking data provided by the banks and business data coming from very different sources, ERPs, payroll, HR management, CRMs, subscription management tools uh, like Zora, payment software like IDN or Stripe, procurement and vendor management solutions. So what I mean is I, I don't think that treasury exists without uh, connectivity uh, and it ensures an in, uninterrupted flow of information and this flow in, of information enables to create accurate cash forecast and manage liquidity for both short term actions and long term planning. And uh, so that's our vision at HCAP. And uh, if you are a mid market company, you are likely to work with multiple banks, multiple bank accounts on a global scale, and also with multiple softwares, uh, like I said, and multiple entities. And this complexity requires a solution to consolidate and centralize a huge amount of, of data from a very wide variety of sources in one single interface. So that's our vision of my vision of connectivity. And, um, and this requires to get a quick and secure look uh, into your cash position. Uh, and before it was almost near, nearly impossible to, to do that uh, when you had to uh, uh, use manual logs uh, into your bank accounts, you had to retrieve data and fill out spreadsheets, uh, which were then connected to even bigger master sheets. It was almost impossible to have this consolidated view of your cash, cash position and cash for cost. So uh, for me, that's my view of connected treasury and uh, uh, I, don't see any solution to do treasury without uh, connectivity. Yeah. yeah, otherwise we have to use very big spreadsheets. Uh, we still love Excel though, uh, but that's uh, oh, yeah. uh, maybe a different webinar. Um, nice bridge to you, uh, Ramon. You work at a multinational company worldwide, a lot of banks, worldwide operations, I think multiple ERP systems. You must have uh, connections, data sources. Um, but what is your most important data source and how did you connect it? What, what type of connection? Yeah, 
<clears throat> so uh, thanks for that. So the most important aid sources we have internally are, of course, the ERPs you already referred to, and the TMS. Uh, ERPs, as you said, we, we have multiple. Uh, we still have uh, quite a lot of uh, legacy uh, systems that we have. Uh, biggest part of our business is Oracle based, so we have different instances of Oracle. And uh, through many acquisitions over the last decade or so, uh, we added on quite a lot of other systems in our landscape uh, of the, the companies that we acquired. And, and then, of course, we have the TMS. So how we deal with the connectivity, especially when it comes to banking data and, uh, and payments, is for uh, the Oracle systems, we use APRO as a, a banking gateway, which allows us to so have the payment files produced by Oracle converted into the right format for the banks to be processed, uh, but also for the, uh, the bank statements that come back into the ERP through APRO, uh, it allows for automatic bank reconciliation, cash application, and also to a large extent automated GL, uh, a journal entry uh, uh, creation. So that, that helps a lot. Um, so for the, the connectivities we have, we, we have host to host with two of our largest banks, where we have the majority of our bank accounts. And then we have all of the other banks connected through a Swift Service Bureau. And that accounts for both the connection towards the TMS as well as to the connection to the ERP systems. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, makes sense. Um, over to you, Matthias, then. Um, you're not a big multinational yet. You, you work at a scale up, much younger company. Um, so your processes are growing. They need to be automated more, as I understood. Um, so looking at your connectivity, what, what is what is your starting point? Uh, and why is it your starting point? Uh, what's your priority? Yeah, thanks for this, Patrick. Indeed, I, I work at a, at a scale up, a VC funded scale up in the e-commerce fulfillment space. Um, I joined about two and a half, three years ago. Um, at that time, there was very little in terms of uh, GNA functions, be that legal, finance or HR. So we really had to turn every stone um, and establish policies, processes and workflows largely from scratch, uh, looking at our plethora of legacy tools that we had um, to maximize our utility of those. Um, but really looking for quick wins in the short term, we quickly realized that uh, one of the things we needed to do was to streamline our month and close process. Um, we had worked with external accountants and we had been the ones that had been doing a lot of the pre-accounting and the bookkeeping, but all of that in different tools that weren't connected to one another. We needed to download files and transfer them over, standardize them and transfer them over into the various uh, local accounting systems, be them DATEV, Zero, or any of the others that you know. Um, so we were introduced by one of our external CPAs to a financial ERP that we've since rolled out in numerous of our entities, not yet all, uh, but many of them, um, which really has allowed us to do uh, a number of things, which is A, to really uh, increase the efficiency of our month and close process, but also to be um, increasing the expertise of the team itself. Um, we're doing a lot more than just prep accounting at this point. We're closer to the data, we're closer to uh, being able to control for accuracy and completeness. Um, we evidently needed to connect our bank accounts um, to this ERP. We work with as many different banks as we work in European uh, um, countries, so it's a hodgepodge yet, yet again. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, in most cases, we download um, end-of-day bank statements and re-upload them into, into the ERP. So while that is a manual process, um, it circumvented the need for additional capital investments and in developing integrations where they didn't exist. At the same time, um, we also have some um, direct bank connections that refresh intraday um, based on the EBIX standard, um, um, and those we use in another tool outside of the ERP um, for things such as accounts receivables management, near real time a matching of uh, payments and and open accounts receivables balances that furthermore now allows us to do a much more effective and timely um, dunning that we had been able to do before. Um, there are a lot of things that we can and will do next, um, but the starting point really was that pragmatic approach to finding a quick win solution to providing capacity and exper uh, expertise to the team to develop and grow, um, hence the focus on the ERP. 
um, at that time. Great, great. Um, so let's move into more more about the details. This is the basic starting point. Hey? Connect your ERP, connect your banks, and uh, um, uh, and then the data sources you need. Uh, but let's dive a little bit more into the details, the type of connections, and and the use cases you have. Um, let me start with you, Ramon. Uh, you talked about the choices you you make. Uh, where to start? Obviously, it was banks, a payment side. Uh, because you have many banks and, and it's important to yeah, you have a lot of payments so it's important to do it in an automated way um, but you also managed mentioned you have both swift host to host uh, you did not mention api um, so how did you decide which con connection method to use uh, for your banks um, and who owns them and who maintains these connections yeah so uh, well we, we decided on those connections already a long time ago. It, it was even already before I started when we established those connections. And we felt that as the connections are still working as they should be, it's not broken. So why would you try to fix something that's not broken? I mean, of course you can use APIs and whatever, but if, if uh, the current way of working still serves what you need, then uh, uh, I think uh, that's, the, the main reason we stick with uh, with the current uh, setup. I think important thing for us, for us it was when we were looking at the connections and uh, especially now that we are embarking on a, a multi-year project to go to one single ERP is also the discussions we had last year with uh, the Oracle team. We, we are implementing one Oracle instance and the, the connections we had with them uh, to see how they wanted to establish connections going forward. Uh, did they want to continue using APRO Banking Gateway or did they have a preference for another solution? Uh, we brought up as, a, as an opportunity to use our treasure management system as a payment hub. Uh, in the end, the decision was made to still go with APRO because of the additional functionality that the TMS couldn't provide, like the, the automatic GL, GL uh, journal entries, creation, and so on, which is, of course, a functionality that the TMS doesn't have. So that's the reason why we stayed with, with that connection. Um, yeah, and when you ask about who owns or maintains the connection, I, I think it's a two-way street. Uh, well, when you talk about the connection, there's always two sides of a connection. One is your own system and the other is the bank system. And if something is broken, then it can either be our system, it can be their system or somewhere in the middle of the channel that interfaces the information. Uh, so I, I think you can't say one or the other. Uh, I think uh, you always have to collectively then look for the sources and uh, and, and see where the issue is coming from and uh, uh, and address it at that point. Yeah, no, indeed, interesting one. Um, over to you, Thomas. Um, you work at the source, eh? uh, you work at a, uh, at a software vendor, uh, TMS provider. You must know all the connections and use all the connections. Um, uh, Not many. Uh, graduating here a little bit. Um, so, probably a lot of APIs, uh, right? Can, can you elaborate with what you use and how do you use it uh, and how to implement it? Uh, yes, of course. Um, first, we don't use only APIs. We have to be very pragmatic about uh, connections because uh, when we, you cannot do with an API, you have to do, uh, you have to find another way. Uh, as mentioned before, we, we consider that our treasury management system needs to be the single source of truth for all transactions in flows that flows. And the objective here is to be able to provide accurate forecast and not only for cash position and payment initiations. Uh, that's the way we work with uh, our TMS, with our own TMS. Um, and like uh, Matthias previously said, said um, there is no one size fits all. Uh, for example, at Agicap, um, our, our current finance tech stack uh, is as followed. Uh, so first, Agicap is the main tool and we use it to centralize different data sources, um, banking data, uh, as we are directly connected with our banks with different banking protocols. 
Abix for French for our French and German banks, Editran for our Spanish banks, Host to Host for our Italian bank, uh, open banking through APIs for our modern banks like Revolut. Uh, second, uh, supplier invoices. Uh, our invoices are directly uh, automatically imported in Agicap through a dedicated mail address. Uh, third, um, we use it also for long-term forecast. Long-term long -term forecast is done by importing the p uh, via an Excel and convert it in app with a with a PNL to cash module in Agicap. It is done each year and it is reforecast quarterly. Uh, we also manage corporate cards and receipts. We centralize all cards expenses in Agicap, uh, so software expenses, team events, and so on. Uh, the second tool we have is Odoo. Uh, it's our ERP, uh, uh, so for accounting and tax purposes. Uh, the third tool we have is our own back office for invoicing and sometimes also Odoo for invoicing. The fourth uh, tool we, we use is Stripe for customer payments. It is directly connected via API uh, with Agicap. The fifth uh, is a, a tool for uh, expense claims, uh, CLIMI. Uh, and the sixth uh, is uh, PayFit uh, for payroll management. So that's uh, a, a lot of tools. Uh, we also have uh, we, we also have a, a CRM, and uh, we have already considered to connect our CRM. We haven't done it so far, but uh, we could actually. And uh, all these tools uh, interacts uh, one with the other. For example, Agicap um, uh, send payment files uh, to the bank uh, via ABXTS protocol, host to host, and soon uh, via Swift too. Second, uh, bank uh, send bank statements to Agicap uh, via the, the same protocol, ABXT, Editran, host to host, Swift, open banking. Um, Agicap sends um, personalized data with STFTP protocol to Odoo, uh, bank statements, bank journal, purchase journal with supplier invoices and, and, spend, uh, and spend invoices and spend uh, expenses. Um, also, Stripe sends uh, data to Agicap via API. Uh, all the cash inflows from subscription in real time uh, are fed with uh, with uh, the Stripe API. And finally, uh, PayFit sends uh, salary payment payment files to Agicap, and uh, the payment initiation is done uh, in Agicap to the bank. So that's it. So uh, just to give you um, a quick overview of our uh, finance tech stack and uh, how uh, each tool interacts with another one. Uh, that's the, the whole view of uh, of, uh, of Agicap uh, tech stack. Yeah, interesting. And these APIs are they built in house by you? It depends. Uh, for for some of them, we have an open API at Agicap, but uh, for some of them, we only use the API of Stripe, for example, or the API. Uh, of uh, PayFit, it is. Um, it, it really depends on uh, uh, on the API uh, which are available uh, for each partner and each software editor. So we we have an open API, but uh, for 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 some software uh, providers, we don't need to use it, and we can use uh, the API of the software uh, provider. And sometimes they don't have any. Uh, it's more difficult to use an API, and we use a SFTP protocol uh, for some uh, some softwares. Yeah. So that's yeah, it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, um, Matthias. You you're much more modern here. I don't want to say modern, um, but who helped you with the connections? And when making a choice, do, do you really consider okay, an, an API is more flexibility, or like like Ramon said, the host host does the trick. So if it works, let's just use that. Uh, um, how do you make that decision? Um, I think I may have suggested before we're mostly driven by pragmatism and opportunity. 
Um, I'm not being a tech guy in the first place, um, would be hard pressed to get the right answer here. Um, but as I said, pragmatism and opportunity balanced with the pressing needs of the day are really what guide us in our, in our decision making. So as I was saying, the, the financial ERP that we, that we implemented, um, that was driven by a need to uh, make our month and closing more efficient, our reporting more robust. Um, at the time when um, we were embarking on a, on a rapid expansion path um, throughout Europe, so we were expected as a finance department, we were expected to do more um, with the same or less, in fact, yeah? um, more transactions per day and week in more legal entities in more countries working with more banks, etc. Um, so a pragmatic approach to that. Um, at the same time, we inherently are a tech company. Um, um, that's how we how we coin ourselves. Our product is a uh, system, a cloud-based system that connects the e-commerce merchants with uh, carriers and warehouses. And ultimately, that is what contains all of our billable events uh, that we use to um, issue our customer sales invoices. Um, and that has been, for better or worse, uh, been built by our internal IT. So they were the driving force in creating our invoicing system simply because that's where all the um, billable items already resided, um, which is both a blessing and a curse at the same time. Uh, we can we can easily make adjustments to it, but we have to balance that with other priorities um, and other things on the development roadmap internally. Um, but that being said, um, well, I, I would like also like to add, in fact, that this data is hugely complex. There are multi-millions of data points every month, anything from shipment uh, destinations, weight sizes, which carrier on um, picks and packs, etc. So it's hugely complex and not easily uh, done outside of the system into something conceivably new. But at the very least, what we were able to do is, uh, somebody mentioned earlier, direct delivery of uh, accounting documents by email connection. So whenever we issue our sales invoices, we immediately um, um, connect them to our ERP as well as to our uh, accounts receivables management tool, which coincidentally is Ajikap. I'll, I'll say that here and now. Um, so from there on out, there's an OCR that helps us with uh, the effective um, um, data capture and posting of our documents um, in those systems. So again, um, largely pragmatic and opportunistic. We're being guided by external advisories, um, uh, be it our external accountants in the case of the ERP or the expertise that comes with Ajikab as a tool that uh, coincidentally not a year and a half ago this was now more needs-based. We were really looking to aggregate all of those, uh, that growing number of bank accounts all over Europe to have a consolidated view of our cash position. Um, one for our FP&A team to, to do um, plan versus actuals reporting, to do some uh, forecasting of our P&L and cash positions, and for us to do, to do Dunning, which here again comes the uh, pragmatic and opportunistic dimension of it. We were sourcing Ajikab as a, as a liquidity planning tool, but the company at the time was, was uh, in the early phases of rolling out um, an accounts receivables management tool, which opportunistically we decided to, um, um, to incorporate in the implementation. So it really is a, um, a changing set of variables that influence our decision making. Um, from one day to another, we have a rough plan where we want to go. Um, but there's a lot that can still be done even within the existing frame, existing framework that we have today. Um, so uh, one step at a time, as they say, you, know, you eat an elephant one uh, bite at a time. Um, and that's where we find ourselves today. Um, we're as near real time as we can be, as I said before, with end of day or in some instances, intraday uh, um, bank statements and journals that are being delivered. But yet again, that also uh, needs to be leveraged by us internally. Our processes and our workflows need to be adapted to actually leverage that and maximize the, the, the efficiencies and the gains that we can get from that. So that disconnect is what we're chipping at uh, marginally every day to yeah. reduce that. Okay, thank you. Maybe to elaborate on that, uh, one more question. Um, so you have connections internally, you have connections which you bought off the shelf and inherited from vendors. Um, how was your IT department looking at those external ones? Um, are they heavily involved? Do they have e eventually the final say? Because that's um, an external connection. Uh, they probably have to audit it. Or 
do, do they have a lot of power in the decision making um, or is it your power like okay this is the most useful way to connect and the fastest way to connect so I want this one uh, how does it play out no we we've been uh, I guess fortunate uh, if that's the right term to 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 have the ultimate decision making authority on what we implement IT is not involved um, from a decision making point of view they're of course supportive if and when it comes to the need to develop or build an integration um, but uh, from a technical expertise yeah, uh, point of view they're they're certainly instrumental but the um, the road mapping of the transformation of the finance slash treasury function is one that is in our hands meaning my, my, myself and the, and the larger uh, um, finance function under a CFO um, the uh, IT, of course, has uh, has had their hands in the game, as I mentioned before, in terms of setting up the customer and sales invoicing process. Yeah, so they too. When I heard uh, Thomas talk about Stripe, yeah, we work with Stripe as well for payments collection. So there is a direct integration that was originally built by our IT department. I consider this all part of the legacy tool stack. Um, but everything that we're doing now um, to to advance and improve is what we do in our own um, discretion, if you will. Um, of course, there's internal feedback, but ultimately um, the decision is made on the utility of the tool rather than um, too deep of a technical analysis. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe let's make this a little bit broader. Um, come on, I'm looking at you. You've been in the industry for, for years. You, you've seen it change, uh, become more techy. Uh, and tech has become important in Treasury. Uh, I think we can conclude without connections, without data, a Treasury standalone is nothing. Uh, but that means a Treasurer also needs more technical knowledge uh, or get it from consultants externally. But I think you would want it in your team. Um, does your team or should your team have a Treasury tech or systems manager uh, alike? Um, now we, we don't have that, uh, um, and, and uh, well, the reason is our team, as for instance, is a uh, software server, so that requires very little maintenance. So if I would have one treasury tech system manager, then that would be, let's say, that, that person would not have a full-time job. So I'd rather have multiple people within the team that have a certain technical knowledge. Uh, so that whenever they work on projects, that they can uh, that they can interact with the, the, the tech folks, the IT folks. So I, I don't think uh, you need to be a, a technical expert, but uh, almost everyone in the team needs to be at least enough tech savvy to be able to have conversations with the IT uh, organization and understand their lingo, what were they talking about, and let's say, uh, are able to express their needs and understand what concerns the tech folks may have. Uh, so that's sort of what, what we are looking for with, 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 yeah, within the team. Yeah, makes sense. And how, how did they learn it in, in the first place? Uh, learning on the job, just by doing it? Yeah, Le think... learning, on, learning on the job. Uh, conferences are, of course, always a good source of uh, new information and, uh, um, yeah. So that, that's how I've learned it. Yeah, uh, yeah. fair point. Yeah. Okay, how about you, Thomas? Uh, how, how is it you? Did, did, do you have a system tech manager within the Treasury team? Or is it more the IT team who supports the Treasury? Uh, they, they are a lot. Not really, but well, uh, I'm not in a good position to, to talk about this perhaps, but actually the, the main advantage with the next generation modern treasury system is that you don't need a fully dedicated resource to manage treasury uh, because otherwise you reserve treasury only to a very big corporates and uh, most companies don't have access to this kind of tool. And for mid-market companies below 200 million turnover, um, I think uh, it shouldn't be necessary to have a fully dedicated treasury tech manager. Uh, I hope so at least. Um, we try at Agicap to be as adaptable as possible here, and we know that some companies uh, cannot afford having a fully dedicated person, even a tech, but even a 
full time treasurer, it's not something uh, uh, mid market company can afford uh, uh, easily. Uh, so we try to um, design a GCAP both for full time treasurers, but also for finance managers or CFOs who are responsible for treasury management, uh, but uh, for whose it's not their sole mission. And uh, in any case, um, you need to have someone who is responsible for treasury management, uh, even if it's not his sole mission. But we try um, to, to offer a solution which um, is uh, which is operational for someone who is just tech savvy, but uh, he is not a tech uh, guy. And um, and uh, actually, uh, the second answer is that um, we don't have a fully dedicated resource to manage treasury um, because also two people intervene on the day-to-day -day operations on uh, an AGCAP. First, we have Quentin, who is not here today, uh, VP Accounting, who manage our payments and follow our cash statements, debt, in, debt and investments. And um, he also follows the fact that uh, our banking connections uh, are updated. Uh, and on the other um, value proposition, uh, we have our FPNA team who import and update forecast in AGCAP. So we have multiple um, uh, roles in AGCAP and people who manage uh, the forecast are not the same um, are not those who manage the daily cash management, for example, and uh, and but to try to to have a solution which is um, easily implemented and uh, easily uh, uh, for which the maintenance is uh, easily done, even if you are not a tech manager. Yeah. So the more automation you have, uh, and the more connections, the less people you need in your treasury department. Should be yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, interesting. Okay. Um, let's talk about real-time treasury. Um, I'm not talking about real-time payments. Really, real-time treasury. So the whole treasury flow. Uh, Matthias, you already mentioned you're already there. Uh, you, you have at, at least for part implemented real-time treasury. Um, but what what did it really bring you? Because it, it's quite a lot of work to implement this. It, it's not only intraday statements and uh, getting them in your TMS because it doesn't stop there. It needs to go to accounting. It needs to be processed. Uh, it needs to be reconciled. How many times a day? Um, you mentioned Dunning already, but uh, the extra effort to bring real-time treasury. Uh, I talked to some treasurers this morning and, and they said it's only half a day which it saves me compared to my just-in-time treasury, which is end of day. Um, so the added benefit of getting there, uh, it, it's quite a steep curve. Um, so was the effort worth uh, uh, worth the extra extra benefits? Um, well, as I think I also mentioned, there's a lot of room still to optimize that potential, right? While we may have the technical uh, capacity to do real time or near real time, um, the, the actual practice is, is still different. Yeah? Um, for instance, we do uh, once a week payment runs. Um, that is, that is uh, a matter of fact, of, uh, a matter of course right now. The um, system that we use to generate our payment file, um, which we upload into the banks for processing, um, is is smart and dynamic enough to really maximize our payment terms yeah? so to really leverage that and to maximize our working capital from that perspective so we don't necessarily have the need to um, to, do, to, to conduct real-time payments um, which of course if they're not being accounted for right uh, right at the same instant what is what is the whole purpose of it anyway so I'm a little bit on the fence with this. Um, everything that is technically possible doesn't necessarily translate into an immediate um, uh, gain, into an immediate benefit. So having these capacities on the one hand is nice, using them on the other hand is is, is uh, work in progress, really. And a matter of prioritizing where are the biggest wins, I've said biggest wins before, that really is a credo, where's the biggest win to be had. Um, Similarly, with uh, with our reporting, yeah? I mean, our reporting is uh, done on a monthly basis. Um, whether or not we are 
getting real-time data is is in that sense not necessarily a an added value. Um, we do use um, intraday uh, intraday bank statements to validate some of our assumptions um, that we may make in our plan. Uh, so again, when it comes to plan the actuals and to corroborating the assumptions that we make for our forecasting, it is nice to have, but not a critical not a critical thing for us, certainly not at this time, maybe in the future, maybe not. Um, it remains to be seen. One, one thing I just wanted to add as well to the previous question about a tech uh, a systems manager, we also do not have that. Uh, we're, we're not at a size, at a scale where this would make any sense at all. Um, but what I do have to say is the, uh, um, the beauty of um, um, in, in intuitive uh, interaction with a tool, be it a TMS, an ERP, whatever there may be. So there's a lot that can be gained from not being an expert, but having an intuitive tool that is user friendly, that everyone can can work with. Um, I echo what what Ramon said as well. You know, people do need to have a certain technical background without being tech experts themselves. Um, yeah, the, the little discourse back to back to the original question. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Huh? Um, we all drive cars, but in the basics, we don't know, need, need to know how a car really works, huh? Com combustion engine, etc. cetera, uh, as long as we know how to drive them. Um, how about you, Ramon? Uh, you work at a big multinational. Does intraday uh, slash real-time make a difference for you? Uh, well, not, not in our treasury, uh, and I'll explain you why. Um, so we, we run a cash pool operation for almost all of the evidence and globally outside of the US. So we have many countries outside the US connected in our cash pool structure. And uh, we also are a commercial paper issuer. Uh, so what we basically do is we try to manage our cash pool balance between minus 10 and plus 10 million on the end of day basis. And then with the the, the CP issuance uh, and CP market is in, in Europe, it's a T plus two market. So uh, whenever you trade CP, it will only settle two days from now. So uh, you need to be ahead of time in when you see cash funding needs and and take a bit of a buffer to uh, to be able to, uh, yeah, let's say, get within the desired bandwidth. Um, and on top of that, with the cash pool that we have, uh, we, we do have sufficiently large uh, daylight overdraft lines uh, agreed upon with the banks so that uh, wherever the money is, the cash won't get stuck and that all of the payments are being executed uh, because of that. So th that, that's basically how we run it and that works very well for us. I mean, you can try to be very precise on uh, steer your cash to zero or whatsoever, but uh, we, we felt that they say that bandwidth that we have is uh, uh, doable for us and balances the uh, yeah the efforts and the cost of uh, of running the program as it is. Yeah, well, interesting. And Thomas, how about you um, from a software vendor perspective? Um, is it a connected treasury, a real-time treasury? Is it your end goal? Um, well, um, uh, I'm aligned with uh, a lot of what uh, Matthias and Ramon uh, have said previously. I try to not to repeat. Uh, Real-time treasury for from a vendor's perspective can be a real game changer for for treasurers, but also for for software vendors. Uh, but first, so far, the traction for real-time treasury, uh, at least in my opinion, remains quite limited, uh, at least for real-time payments. Um, the real-time payment protocols are gaining market share, are gaining tra traction, but really slowly. And uh, there is not yet a, a strong momentum. Uh, I don't know if you if you agree with that, uh, uh, Matthias and Ramon, uh, but uh, that's what we, 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 we see uh, from, from, uh, from AgiCap. Um, I guess that there is a reason is that um, uh, all treasurers would really like to get paid with real-time payment methods but, and improve their DSOs, but so far I'm not sure that a lot of CFOs and treasurers are ready to pay an additional fee for instant payments 
in order to pay uh, in real time their suppliers. So uh, I guess that the, the, there is some tech, tech use case, but uh, so far uh, there is no traction because uh, the business case is not that strong. Um, what real time treasury changes for software vendors? First, uh, software need to softwares need to provide real time data. Uh, that's really a game changer. It is changing to retrieve data from banks and from an increasing number of soft softwares in real time. Uh, it's better if you have APIs, but uh, it really depends on the, the, the nature of uh, your, your connection. That also means that you can no longer work with manual imports. For example, uh, we, we previously mentioned uh, this kind of, uh, of use case. It has to be fully automated with very regular updates at least, and ideally even real-time synchronization. The second thing is that um, uh, software, software vendors need to manage real-time payments, uh, which implies two takeaways. The first one is that uh, it requires to manage additional payment initiation protocols. So it's an additional investment. And most of the time, it's an uh, additional protocol for each geography. Uh, for the US, it's not the same protocol as for the UK, and it's not the same protocol as for Germany and, and the European Union and, uh, and France, for example, and for Italy. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that it, it, it's um, when payment is processed in real time, there is no room for mistake. So it's a real game changer in your fraud management, payment validation workflows you you cannot uh, you cannot uh, call back your your banker to cancel a payment uh, once the payment in se is sent you have 5 seconds and then uh, it is uh, it is processed so uh, this is a real game changer and the software vendors have to reinforce fraud management have to reinforce the payment validation workflows uh, to, to, to be relevant for real-time payments and real-time treasury. And the first thing, uh, which is really important for us, is that you really have to reconsider, reconsider revamp your customer experience if you have uh, uh, designed it for, uh, for, for treasury, uh, for not uh, real-time treasury. Um, TMS needs to display data to finance teams proactively and in real time uh, if you have real time treasury uh, and no matter where CFOs and treasurers are. I mean that you have to be uh, completely mobile friendly. Uh, you have to provide alerts and notification no matter where treasurers and CFOs are, if they are in, uh, in an airport or uh, uh, elsewhere or in a restaurant, they need to, to, to access data in real time. Uh, and you need to have um, uh, a very good experience in your mobile app, uh, which uh, most TMS uh, do not provide so far, I think. So that's it for me. Uh, there is uh, first, uh, you, you need to, to revamp all your banking and ERP connectivity to, 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 to have real time. You have to reconsider uh, all your validation workflows and uh, fraud management. Uh, you have also to revamp your customer experience to 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 be relevant in a real-time treasury environment. So uh, that's a real game changer for software vendors. Yeah, it's almost scary, yeah. Uh, if it's treasury is 24/7, I cannot work nine to five anymore. I have to work 24/7, and in the weekends uh, I have to to create shifts in my treasury team to make sure. Everybody's on this cash every time eh, and making optimal use. Uh, I get your point, Thomas. It's it's a little bit chicken egg, eh? the, 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 the regulation and in some countries, uh, real time payments, at least are premium product. Um, I think the EU is trying to change that now with new regulation. Eh? So maybe in one, two, three years, uh, at least instant payments in the EU are the new normal. Um, in the Netherlands, they are uh, because 90% of the banks are instant payments, at least B2C, uh, not necessarily B2B and bulk payments. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, let's let's do the same webinar in three years' time uh, and see if we have uh, have different answers. Um, but the interesting point you mentioned, 
it's 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 the frets eh? um, because if we can do 10 second payments my money is out it's gone i can't get it back so my data quality has to be top notch or checks has to be done upfront uh, and not if, even if i make a mistake i can maybe still cancel all uh, a t plus one payment but not an instant payment um, so let's talk a little bit about the threads as well um matthias let's start with you um how do you ensure data quality in in your ar ap all of your data uh, your different data sources hmm. Um, well, as I said before, you still need to have humans interacting with the data, right? Um, I think at this point, we're um, largely reliant on the fact that the connections that we have do ensure quality data that is not, um, that is not leaking, that is not being corrupted in the process. Um, but we do have uh, a set of eyes looking over it, uh, evidently. Um, I think one of the one of the scares with with increased integrations and automations is, uh, as I mentioned, the more the more you rely on it, um, if one of them goes away, breaks temporarily, what do you do if you do not have such a manual workaround that I'm describing by means of a human still interacting with the data? So anytime we we do embark on on an integration automation project, we do ensure that there is some kind of workaround that helps us in the case of a contingency event. Um, that being said, just, just recently we had one where a bank uh, changed something in their setup and all of a sudden our intraday uh, EBIX did not flow anymore and it took a couple of days until we realized how, what and why, what needed to be done until it got fixed. Um, so relying on real time uh, at that point would have would have also not necessarily been to our, to our benefit. Um, as I said before too, it's not, not because it's technically possible, must it be implemented, yeah? there still is, um, room for critical thinking and decision making is this really relevant in our context are we ready for it um, does it provide the extra value um, particularly if it is an additional investment um, how do we ensure that data is not corrupted um, really in a way that's something that I may naively consider outsourced when we talk about you know, third-party vendors that provide us with these setups, that provide us with a, with a tool, with an API. Um, there's very little I, from my vantage point anyway, can do to control and check for that. Um, it brings me back to what you had asked earlier, Patrick, about the role of our own IT um, to vet, check, uh, and, and, and maintain existing connections. That, again, is that uh, chicken and egg problem. If I waited for our IT for better or worse, uh, it, we wouldn't get ahead of ourselves. And so sometimes you just have to take that that next step in that direction, uh, put your best foot and effort forward. And that's, I think, largely what we, what we have been doing, understanding that we need to be a lean and efficient operation, that we cannot hire, uh, that we cannot double the size of a finance team simply because the volumes have doubled. Um, counterproductive as everybody knows and so um, we rely on this there's tremendous opportunity and potential um, but those are indeed concerns that, that that resonate with me that I don't necessarily have the right answer to if there is one um, but happy to hear also what my fellow panelists have to say in this respect yeah no, interesting Ramon do you have a backup plan in your treasury to do it manually um, do you do checks uh, um, to make sure your data quality keeps uh, remains high or is high? Yeah, well, all of the data that we have requires uh, four eyes principles. So uh, you you can't have one person change the data and then it's there. There always needs to be a review of the data by a second person. And on top of that, we, we do have a business continuity plan that we also test on an annual basis. So, for instance, when it comes to making payments, uh, if, for instance, the connectivity between our TMS and the banks is out, then we are always able to make the payments through our uh, e-banking solutions that we have with the banks, uh, which is the, let's say the, the backup plan that we have. Um, uh, when it comes to trading, fixed trading, for instance, which we currently do through the electronic trading platforms, uh, yeah, in that case, you also have to be able to pick up the phone, 
call the the desks of the banks to to make the trade and and so on. So uh, there's always ways to to be able to to do that. It's important for that pur purpose that you have at least separately outside of your system as well your your contact points available so that whenever your system is out. Uh, you still know uh, which phone number to call for which bank. Uh, it's, it seems so so stupid, so obvious. But in in these days, everyone relies on uh, the electronic calendars, the email box, and wherever you find your contact details of your banker and so on. But uh, yeah, just to have those phone numbers listed in in some source outside of your TMS or your your um, your systems uh, may help in that respect as well. Yeah, just call people eh? physically. Yeah. <laughs> Only if that breaks, then, then then we have a real issue, I think. But that's let's not go that far. <laughs> okay, before I move to the last uh, section and the last set of uh, of questions, uh, we do already have one uh, audience question waiting. Um, but hey, audience, we have we have more than 90 people uh, in, in, in the room here. Uh, you have a panel of experts here. You probably must have questions about Connected Treasury. This is your chance to, to, to ask the experts. Do you have questions? Put them in the chat and we will answer them later on. Um, so the last section, let's, let's look ahead into the future. Huh? Um, well, the future has already begun. We're already connected. But in five, ten years from now, we're even more advanced. Eh? Imagine looking back ten years, how uh, Excel-based we were, or how not connected we were. Um, so let's let's imagine it's it's ten years from now. We have AI, we have APIs, we have everything in the cloud. How will your treasury look like then? Are there even treasurers around? I don't know. Maybe everything is done by a system. Um, let's start with you, Thomas. Uh, from a vendor perspective, um, you're ahead of the curve. How do you see your tools and your treasury in 10 years? Uh, so first, I think there will still be uh, treasurers and CFO to manage treasury. It's very, very complex. <laughs> and I'm not sure that in five years uh, you will have a software who will be able to uh, and all the process uh, by his own, and uh, so uh, obviously the, uh, there will be uh, always uh, treasurers and CFOs to to do the job. Um, if uh, I try to, to to extrapolate and to to think uh, a little bit about the future, um, first we could think about uh, that open banking uh, can replace legacy protocols uh, like ABIX. Uh, uh, and uh, it could be really a game changer uh, to 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 get things uh, uh, easy easier uh, for banking uh, aggregation. Uh, but uh, this goes with one specific condition: uh, banks uh, need to be incentivized to develop this kind of technology, and that's not the case so far. So. Uh, I'm um, very cautious about this prediction. Uh, I'm not sure this will happen uh, very, uh, very fast. The second thing uh, on still on the banking connectivity, we can we can see uh, or we can hope is a standardization of files uh, at, at the, uh, the content and the structure. Um, the content and the structure are different from one bank to another and uh, even more from one country to another. Uh, if we had some kind of standard, standardization of files, uh, uh, if the file was the same for all banks, European and worldwide, it will really be a game changer for, for our treasury management. Um, the, the the need to manage uh, uh, a lot of different files formats uh, it complexifies a lot uh, treasury management. Um, third thing, uh, if we had um, uh, management or normalization of metadata, uh, having invoice data and payment data in the same file to facilitate reconciliation, it will also be, I think, a, a game changer. Uh, that's for banking connectivity. And the second thing I uh, the, on, on third party tools uh, like ERPs, what I see is that um, uh, um, 
we also could have uh, some kind of standardization of files format, uh, in particular uh, with electronic invoicing. Uh, this could help standardize uh, the different files, uh, but it will really be a game changer if uh, it is thought uh, at an international level and not an, uh, at a national level only. Uh, if you have electronic invoicing specific to France, specific to Germany, specific to Italy, well, uh, it will still be a nightmare. Uh, perhaps not the same, but uh, but still. Uh, what we can think about too is um, a unified API, like for example, Shift, to limit direct direct APIs. It can be an option uh, in the future as well, um, and uh, it can be game changer. Um, so you had a, a last question uh, about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, how it could help. Uh, first, it could uh, add intelligence to complement the data and cross data sources. Um, uh, you, you can uh, have uh, strong use cases around uh, banking reconciliation with artificial intelligence. The second thing is that um, it can help standardized format uh, if uh, banks don't do it. Uh, and uh, the third thing is that AI, um, and that's a limitation, AI will still need exhaustive data points to be efficient. Uh, you can have all the AI models uh, you can imagine. Uh, if you don't have uh, uh, an exhaustive and accurate data, uh, it would be useless. Yeah. Garbage in, garbage out. Eh? I, I do like your future one payment format, uh, one API to rule them all. That it's would be great. So far. That, uh, that would make our life so much easier. Let's. Uh, we have only three more minutes left. Uh, let, let's do the audience question first. Um, let, let's see. Have your free panel uh, uh, to answer it. Um, I'll just read it out. EU regulation requires a qualified electronic signature. How do you fulfill set regulations within the treasury structures described? Talking about host to host, for example. Yeah, as, as far as I know, that EU regulation is only for, is, is the electronic identity. Uh, and, and that's, to my knowledge, only required, for instance, if you need to do tax return claims, for instance, on behalf of a legal entity, or if you need to have something changed with the Chamber of Commerce on behalf of legal entities through their portals, there it would require, to my understanding, a qualified electronic signature, but not when you authorize a payment to be uh, going out through host to host. That's, that's also we, how I understand it. Else Thomas. Has other understanding. Yeah. Thomas? Yes, I, I confirm it's, it's my understanding yeah. too. Yes. No, I, I agree, I agree. Um, we have one minute left, maybe quickly about the future. Matthias, how do you see the future in a connected treasury? What's your vision? Uh, we still have a long way to go, but we'll, but we'll use those next five to ten years to connect, connect, and connect some more. Uh, I think the more the more you connect, the more you realize how much more you want to connect, right? You're going down this rabbit hole and you see all this potential. To me, and again, not being a tech guy, I think it would be really nice to, to make it even more intuitive, more plug and play, more easily to be implemented. Um, I think one of the things that Tomas just mentioned, the standardization of files, yeah, or as you said, Patrick, one API to rule them all. Um, that would make my life a lot easier um, and uh, really looking forward to, to hopefully moving in that direction. Um, I'll leave it at that in the interest of time. Yeah. No, I agree. Eh? Um, I think to, to summarize uh, this webinar, Connected Treasury, uh, we are making good steps to connect more and more different tools with each other. Data is becoming the issue. Uh, data quality is the issue more data availability and making sure you can process this data. Um, but I think we're now at a turning point uh, where parties are working together, banks, vendors, uh, treasuries, uh, to make sure we, we will get there uh, and also to work, hopefully, um, on this standardization. Um, one tool, one system, or one API, not one tool, one system, uh, one standard, uh, that, that would be great. Uh, and I know Swift is working on that. Um, 
but let's see what the future brings. Um, it does bring us at the end of this webinar, exactly four o'clock now, um, at least in my time zone. Um, thank you, panel. Um, I really learned some new insights here from you. Uh, I hope the audience did as well. Uh, on the top, we had more than uh, 100 people joining in. So uh, definitely a successful webinar. Um, thanks, audience, for uh, listening in, um, joining this webinar, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you.